34. Recording in progress. room and press briefing room uh, set up. Can you hear me? And yes. Yes. <laughs> Hello, Dal. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. Hello, this is Alan. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, yes, we could for a bit, but we don't see you anymore, but that's okay. <laughs> okay, well, I can put my camera on, of course. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much. And there was a session just finishing in this room, so we can start now. So, uh, as a MAC member, it's a pleasure to me to be on site and moderate this, this session, this workshop uh, with which. Uh, Ah, okay. Okay, perfect. Thank okay, you so perfect. much, Alan, and uh, thank, you uh, thank you to everyone for joining. I think we can get started. So what I'll do here is just just shake just a minute. Oh. We'll wait a minute to be online, right? We wait one minute and start. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Now, can you prove that you can share your screen? It, yes. It, okay. Yes, oh, it works. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening. Uh, as well as you, as you can see. Uh, I'm the only person on site uh, who's go going to moderate this session. Uh, it's a pleasure for me as a MAC member to be involved in this. Uh, so uh, as you know, the, the theme of this uh, open forum is privacy risk management in artificial intelligence. This is a quite interesting topic. And uh, with me on the moderation is going to be Mr. Dal, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Dal Singh, 
right? Uh, and many speakers, as you can see, uh, are connected online or as well. So, uh, Dal, the floor is yours. I understand you have a, pres a presentation for all of us. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Alan. And can we just confirm people can see our screen here? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, okay, well, uh, yes. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. I wish we could be there in person, but alas, uh, plans get disrupted. Uh, it's particularly nice for us to uh, be able to present the first time here in this open forum number 94 session in our capacity as members of the Global Privacy Assembly. Um, so first, I think we'll just uh, do some introductions. Uh, I'm Dal Singh. I'm, at, I'm a senior policy analyst at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Ethan Plato. I'm legal counsel at the uh, Office of the Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia, Canada, so the west coast of Canada. Hi, I'm Christina Zena. I'm working for the Federal Commissioner for Data Protection and Freedom of Information from Germany in the Technical Data Protection Department. Morning. Here is Roberto Lattanzi from the Italian Data Protection Authorities. I am the head of the department in charge of artificial intelligence. Oh, Sophia, we can't hear you. Ooh, no, I'm afraid not. Or you need to restart the Zoom session, maybe? All right, we will, All right. Uh, we will uh, wait for Sophia to Thank join. You. Um, Sophia and try uh, speaking. Uh, can you hear me uh, now? Yes. yes, we can. <laughs> Great. Okay, cool. Uh, so, good morning again. Uh, I'm Sophia Natidu and I'm a group manager for AI and data science at the Information Commissioner's Office, the GTA Data Protection Authority. Okay. And we should note that we are only uh, five members out of the about 26 other authorities who compose, who compose the broader working group. Uh, so today we'll be discussing privacy risk management in AI. Um, AI governance has had considerable attention in the past few years, um, but we find the discussion tends not to emphasize the role of data protection and privacy in that sort of puzzle, so, or tend to just cover it very briefly without describing what the specific risks and the kinds of things we must do to address them. And so it's with that perspective that our working group of the GPA decided to pursue working on this further uh, on an international level and the kinds of things that we as privacy regulators believe should be uh, part of the conversation. So what we will be, um, uh, covering today oh, is just provide first a background of the GPA and our AI working group, um, and then uh, sort of uh, managing and mitigating the risks of AI systems, the risk management process, and then we'll have some considerable time for questions and discussion. 
So first, let me just provide some context about the GPA for those who are unfamiliar. Uh, the Global Privacy Assembly was first established in 1979. First, as the- You don't see the slide now. Oh, no? Let's try. We can now? Okay. Sorry. Yes, perfect. Correct. Um, so the conference was for our, our organization was first called the International Conference for Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. Uh, we are an international organization comprised of over 130 members of the world's data protection authorities or privacy regulators. Uh, and we are independent bodies of the national governments um, that we represent. So, uh, so because privacy is a global issue, we recognize that international cooperation is, you know, a good method to sort of address some of these issues. And so we do this through the GPA. And so the GPA meets annually for a conference. The most recent one was just in Istanbul last month um, and has adopted a strategic plan and documents and uh, those can all be accessed on the website at globalprivacyassembly.org. So there's a number of, you know, working groups, um, uh, you know, that the GPA has established. So we are the AI ethics and data protection in AI working group just here. Um, but there's a number of other ones as well. Uh, you can access all the reports and documents from all the working groups on the website. So uh, past items that we've worked on include the Declaration on Ethics and Data Protection in AI. Um, it has several other co-sponsors, but it's just cut off here for uh, brevity. Uh, um, uh, but more recently, we've also had the uh, resolution on accountability and the development and use of AI. Um, so these types of documents reflect, the significance of them is that they reflect data protection authorities' positions and views and signal our general sort of approach to emerging and topical issues. Um, we have also conducted a number of internal activities, including a survey on uh, our authorities' own capacity to deal with AI issues, as well as uh, we've created a subgroup on facial recognition technology, which has produced its own sort of framework. Um, in our ongoing work, uh, we'll focus on issues such as the use of AI within the employment context, um, among others. And so we value the opportunity to engage with you and other groups. So please get in touch with us, even just to introduce yourself. Our emails will be posted at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'll uh, pass it over to Sophia. Uh, thank you, Dal. And uh, I hope you can hear me again. Uh, so the thinking of the general risk management framework we're presenting here uh, was actually grounded on the uh, Declaration on Ethics and Data Protection in AI that Dal just mentioned, that was signed in uh, 2018 in Brussels, but also the Resolution on Accountability in the Development and Use of AI that was adopted in October uh, 2020. Uh, and that affirmed that responsibility for the operation uh, and effects of AI systems remain with human actors and accountability should be assessed. Again, clearly defined uh, principles uh, and frameworks. So um, with that in mind, the GPA AI working group that we're representing here uh, went on to develop a framework for managing risks, uh, risk in AI systems across the supply chain uh, and that was presented at the last uh, GBA uh, conference this year in, in Istanbul that Dal also mentioned earlier. So the framework we agreed on uh, sets out um, nine overarching aspects uh, that we think should be considered uh, across the AI life cycle. Uh, some of these aspects uh, you can see in this slide and are linking to uh, well-known uh, data protection and privacy frameworks uh, that are um, uh, existing frameworks uh, from around the world, namely the uh, uh, GDPR that uh, lots of uh, data protection and privacy experts are familiar with. And uh, yeah, so you can see most of these uh, aspects are non-controversial and quite common sense, I would say, uh, fairness, lawfulness, um, transparency. Uh, but yeah, we'll get into more details in the next couple of minutes. Um, uh, can, can we pass to the next slide, please? Thank you. 
So just giving more detail in terms of what we mean by those aspects that we think should govern the uh, risk mitigation in terms of AI going forward. Uh, so first of all, uh, there is an issue around fairness and lawfulness. Uh, we believe that um, uh, organizations using and deploying AI uh, should uh, make sure that uh, uh, they process personal data in that context in a way that is fair and in a way that leads to fair outcomes. Uh, we believe uh, AI should be used in good faith and would, should not seek to exploit uh, human, human vulnerabilities. And there should always be a legal basis on which uh, data is being processed for AI training uh, and use. Um, and in terms of transparency and explainability, again, uh, transparency is needed in terms of uh, when AI is actually used. Uh, some, some, sometimes people are not even aware AI is actually implicated in a decision-making process. Uh, transparency is, is also relevant to uh, making sure uh, models and training data, data and other details around the system are accessible and transparent to regulators so they can discharge their respective, uh, respective functions accordingly. Um, and uh, there is also a need for AI explainability. Um, so explainability relates to uh, making people aware of the nature of, the of a decision. Uh, what kind of training data was used in, in development, uh, also uh, what kind of personal data uh, in general inform the decision across the decision-making process, and general rules around um, uh, how was the decision-making process structured and what were, were the parameters uh, of that decision-making process. But also people should be aware of what is the likely impact of an AI-driven decision more broadly. Again, this kind of thinking also maps into existing data protection and privacy frameworks uh, that I think are, are already utilized to regulate AI to a certain extent. And all this while considering the fact that inferences, uh, AI-driven inferences, um, when they're linked to an individual, remain personal information, so relevant, relevant regulation applies. And any um, approaches that we suggest here should not uh, prejudice uh, law enforcement function, functions or other legal obligations organizations that use AI or develop AI have. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, thank you. So another aspect uh, that we think organizations using and developing AI should uh, take into account is putting in place appropriate measures to accommodate uh, recourse and redress. Uh, so in order for individuals to exercise any rights they may have in relation to AI, they should be aware of uh, any um, tools and processes that are in place uh, to enable them challenging AI-driven decisions and AI-driven AI deployments. Uh, mechanisms enabling human review, uh, scrutinizing AI-driven outputs should be in place. Uh, and in certain jurisdictions, actually, those may, may be actually legally uh, mandated as well, uh, especially when it comes to Article 22 uh, related uh, decisions. Article 22 is, is one of the key uh, provisions in the GDPR that relates to solely automated decision making processes. Uh, the other aspect that we feel is, is important for organizations to take into account uh, is the data minimization and storage limitation aspects that are already principles in, in data protection uh, and more specifically in the GDPR, even though uh, you know, I'm, I'm aware GDPR is an EU framework. Um, so that re relates to uh, using the least amount of data to train and use AI systems and making sure any data retention periods are proportionate to the goal that uh, you're trying to achieve when you're using uh, or developing uh, AI. And I think I will just stop here and pass on to Ethan. Thank you, Sophia. Uh, good, very early morning to everyone, at least for me uh, over yes. here. It's <laughs> currently 3.07 a.m. for me. Um, so I apologize for maybe the bags under my eyes a little bit, but I'm very pleased to be here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna continue on for the, uh, take the baton on from Sophia with speaking to the last few um, elements of uh, the risk framework that the working group uh, has identified. Um, continuing on that theme, we've got 
uh, some more, I would say, as Sophia said, some fairly um, common privacy principles that we see cropping up in, in, when, as, as they apply to artificial intelligence. The first one here being purpose limitation data processing. Uh, essentially that processing um, or use or whatever the, the language uh, that is relevant for the particular jurisdiction uh, should be limited to a specific purpose or rely on exception, exceptions that may exist depending on the jurisdiction. So if you identified law enforcement, but we're also talking about some, some jurisdictions or uh, some jurisdictions have things like um, comparable or compatible or consistent purposes, or there's research provisions, or they may well have, um, you know, as we're seeing come up slowly now, yeah, AI specific legislation that has some use or training purpose provisions in it. Um, the next one being the accuracy of data and data quality. Uh, personal information, this is essentially the issue of garbage in, garbage out with artificial intelligence or any, any kind of use for sure, but I think with artificial intelligence is particularly acute or AI systems. Uh, so inaccurate or low quality, quality data will impact uh, the, the output. And so a regular review of data sets and outputs for bias or discriminatory, result, discriminatory results is also uh, essential as we know that there's some risk uh, to harm to fundamental human rights that I think are, well, that, that we know are, are um, immutable and, and should not be um, cast aside just because of a, the use of, of a new technology. The next one is accountability and liability. Um, and this, again, is a, is a fairly, um, uh, one of the pillars of, of most um, uh, data protection or privacy uh, piece of legislation, which is that organizations are responsible for uh, the adverse impacts of AI systems. Um, and there's also needs to be some sort of a system that comes into place, a liability system, of course, um, depending on the jurisdiction again, um, that, um, that attaches to individuals themselves uh, who, so it's more than just organizations, but there is some, some individual accountability that um, the, the, the working group recognized would be uh, necessary or is necessary. Um, and then moving to the next one, we've got data. Oh, uh, sorry, Dal, just back on one last quick there. Sorry uh, about that. No problem at all. And this is, uh, and this is a quick one, I promise. It's a quick one. So it's just uh, data security. This is something that we always, um, as, as data protection authorities are always very careful um, to uh, state is that uh, data protection is, is essential, especially with artificial intelligence is no different. Uh, technical and organizational security measures should always be appropriate to the current state of the technology. Um, and in this case, of course, data protection is the same thing, is, is very, very closely tied to the protection of individuals. Um, okay, now we can go to the next one. <laughs> okay, so the, la um, the last one here uh, on my end is, uh, it's a doozy, it's a big one, um, and it's consideration of ethical aspects. And so this is, this is one that's a little bit more, um, I would say, aspirational um, or or uh, high level because we're, we're talking about here is this this tension that we're seeing uh, play out everywhere or we, we can anticipate will play out, continue to play out in, in a lot of ways is um, the huge potential on one hand that um, our AI systems or artificial intelligence has for uh, doing doing really doing good for humanity. Uh, but then the idea that there needs to be some protections and there's, uh, there's still, it's still a human creation and there's a lot of ways um, a lot of the, the ethical uh, challenges that we face in everyday life uh, with technology or, or just in interactions are going to be even more heightened when you overlay uh, such a powerful technology on top of it. And there's things that um, an AI system can do that uh, you know, an, a, a, um, a, an individual or, or kind of more analog systems can't do. I mean, one, one thing that I always like to talk about or, or at least bring up is uh, in the case of for example, law enforcement and an individual police officer or one police force can only knock on so many doors uh, in one day, but an AI enabled system is able to knock on um, a lot of door, a lot more doors, uh, so to speak, uh, digitally than, um, than, than, than an officer would be able to do walking down uh, through a neighborhood. Um, and so this, what we're talking about here is there needs to be a detailed empirical and careful review of, of any new system. Uh, and AI systems must still abide by and be contained by legal frameworks set out to protect humans, in particular fundamental rights. I mean, in particular, we're also looking at, uh, the, the group also pointed to things like uh, so group social scoring or group level correlations that have the potential for some very serious 
uh, infringements uh, on, a, on a social level on some protected grounds. Um, so what we have on the right here are a number of ethical principles. They're non-exhaustive, but uh, I invite you to take a look at them. Uh, our paper has some more detail on each of them, but essentially we're talking about non-malfeasance, uh, beneficence, uh, which is well-being, which preserves human dignity, equality, sustainability, and solidarity, justice and fairness of outcome, including non-discrimination, liability, whistleblowing protections and processes, and autonomy, which is self-determination and freedom of choice. So um, with that, um, I'm gonna pass on the baton to Roberto, uh, who is um, joining us from Italy. Yeah, <clears throat> many thanks, uh, Ethan, also for getting up so early today. And good morning to everybody from Rome. So uh, like the more traditional data processing systems, also artificial intelligence systems are general purpose technology. Therefore, the actors and stakeholders that can be engaged are, are, are weighed numbers and, and on different level as well. We can look at the slide and we see that there are regulators First of all, is the legislator as well as the public authorities that can be in charge of the governance of artificial intelligence systems, then researchers, obviously, and standard organizations. Then what is most interesting and direct liability could be, could be, um, in, in, could be introduced, it relates producers and providers of different nature in providing artificial intelligence systems and end user intended as users of artificial intelligence systems. In terms of data protection, usually the end user could be or should be considered as data controller and to them then applies the data protection principle that Sophia has um, spoken about uh, at the beginning of our discussion. Um, the kind of liability and engagement of, of, of all these actors and stakeholders is not the same, could be different, uh, more or less, but all of them have something to do, have something to say, uh, speaking about risk management process in artificial intelligence systems. Um, what is also relevant to be said is that the task is not done once forever. The process that relates uh, the, the management of artificial intelligence system is a dynamic one, is a continuous one, and go through the pro to the life cycle of an artificial intelligence system. On all the side of the individuals we have identified here, and there's a non-exhaustive list, as it, it, it can be identified other other stakeholders and actors due to the ongoing legislative process in different jurisdiction. You can find at the end of the document of the GPR, a useful uh, matrix, accountability matrix, we have said that, uh, that could be useful. Next slide, please, now. Okay, the, the, what are the, the main factors concerning the artificial intelligence specific risks? The, the GPA has identified two main areas that could be relevant in order to um, identify the specific risks introduced by artificial intelligence system. One is given to the uh, proper characteristic of the different artificial intelligence system that can be uh, used at different level uh, using looking at the, uh, at the software, at the um, functionalities that are used at the data processing operation that have been done, both relating the training of data and then the application of data. So the first factors I would say is the characteristic of the artificial intelligence system. The second factor that is very, very much relevant is the context of application of the artificial intelligence system. So uh, as we have said, the systems are dynamic and they need to be Manage and measured in one sense in concrete or not in abstract. Every system needs to be looked in its own context by the different stakeholders that we have identified. 
So that's very uh, relevant. And from this point of view, the social, cultural, ethical values that characterize the application context of the individual affected by artificial intelligence systems should be considered in order to identify the adverse consequences for individuals that Ethan more or less have introduced speaking about the ethics uh, aspect related to artificial intelligence system. Next slide, please. And I'm sure a, a lot of you will be familiar with the risk identification that are here identified in a known exhaustive list, I will say. Um, in, in some cases, we have just um, in, in the practice, in practice, we have seen that uh, there has been violation of fundamental ethical principles um, related to the self-determination of human beings or the exploitation of human facilities. But then we have also the violation, this is the core of the interest of the data protection authorities, a fundamental principle related to personal data protection. As you know, the data protection rights is not a standalone right, it's a cluster right. So it, it, it aims to protect other fundamental rights and legitimate interests of individuals. Um, the, 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 the other category of risk uh, is well known concerning artificial intelligence is the risk of unfair discrimination of individuals for many reasons. The more traditional ones are related to gender or ethnic origin, and we have just uh, case law in, in this area, but uh, the, the GPA uh, raised the attention to, to the need to look at the emerging form of discrimination as well. Obviously, the deprivation of rights of freedom of individuals and the safety of individuals is another risk that could be, ra be raised by artificial intelligence systems and then we don't have only individual risk or group uh, risk in one sense, but we could have also risk that are related to the society at large, both on social, on the social systems, uh, just think to uh, deep fakes or, or disinformation, or another area that is relevant as social one, so it's not only on, on individuals, is related to the impacts on uh, environment and due to the use of uh, artificial intelligence system. The next and the last slide, I think. So as is traditional concerning the, the determination of risk level, we have two main factors as well. The first one is the likelihood of occurrence of the event caused by artificial intelligence. And the second one is the severity of the magnitude or on the consequences concerning individuals, groups, and society at, at large. So uh, it, it, it's for necessary to calculate appropriately the risk uh, by each of the relevant stakeholders that we have identified at the beginning. Um, in order to allocate the responsibility and identify the suitable mitigating measures that will be part of the talk of Christina. Thank you, Roberto. Hello from uh, Germany, and I'm very pleased to be here. So um, let's have a look on the mitigating measures. Uh, we've heard now quite a lot about important aspects and the frameworks that need to be considered when building or using AI systems. And so let's take a concrete look at possible mitigating measures. Mitigating measures are a core element of responsible use of AI systems, because that's what we can actively do to find a good way to deal with AI. They can offer us ways for preventing harm to individuals and society by providing a framework for dealing with ethical privacy and data protection risks, as we heard before. So everything we heard so far tells us that risk-based approach is about identifying risks, classifying them, and managing them as appropriate. 
Um, the mitigation measures offer approaches to do just that. It is not about banning things from the outset, but about minimizing and controlling risks for the benefit of the people. And this allows for innovation and at the same time protects the rights of those affected. Um, next slide, please, Dal. Thank you. So what are possible actions we can take? Implement a profound risk management process. This might sound simple, but it is an essential basis for the adequate analysis and dealing with risks during the entire life cycle of an AI system. All actors must be involved in this. AI systems should be developed in a way that does not jeopardize the rights of individuals or groups. And as soon as there is even the slightest reason to doubt this, there has to be precisely a definition of controls on potential high risk use cases. Use cases, been, use cases can always be very helpful to estimate the risks. And then of course, we must not forget the area of security. We heard something about that too. It is very important to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures and procedures proportional to the type of system, the risk level, the nature of personal data processed and the categories of individuals affected. Depending on the structure of the system, of course, this is partly to be decided on a case by case basis, but in some cases we can also take a systematic approach. Ensuring algorithmic transparency and the audibility of systems is a challenge, no question, but we have to find ways and instruments to make sure that uh, AI does not become the so-called black box. This also includes providing adequate information on the purpose and effects of the AI system, ensuring that individuals are always informed appropriately. For example, when they are interacting directly with an AI system, chatbot or something like that, or when their personal data is processed by such systems. Next slide, please. And an enormously important aspect of this is ensuring the accuracy of training data. Ethan mentioned this before. There is a high risk potential there because massive biases occur over and over again. We can find a lot of examples of how algorithms surprisingly consistently discriminate against different groups with machine biases. Um, I guess we all know the example, I think it was in 2014, uh, when a large company in the US developed software that used artificial intelligence to rank female and male job applicants. It became clear that the algorithm discriminated against female applicants because the training data was consistently obtained from existing staff, probably men. So ensuring the accuracy of training data sets and the application of the data minimization principle including by using anonymized or synthetic data is a very central aspect. This also shows how important it is that we produce specific guidance and principles in addressing biases and discrimination. There has to be an awareness raising in understanding the massive potential effects of such biases for individuals and for the society. One option can also be fostering collective and joint responsibility involving the whole chain of stakeholders, including through the development of sectoral standards and the sharing of best practices. That means promoting accountability of all relevant actors, as we heard from Roberto, including audits, continuous monitoring, impact assessment, and periodic review of existing oversight mechanisms. And then of course, establishing governance processes, such as relying on trusted third parties certification mechanisms, uh, setting up ethic committees, and so on. And last but not least, it will not surprise you that uh, we would like to make this point especially strong here, supporting data protection and privacy authorities and placing them at the center of AI governance. Effective data protection supervision requires very well-trained staff and proper equipment of the authorities. This might be the only way we can empower people to exercise their rights, including the right to information, the right to access, the right to object or at least restrict the processing of personal data, the right to erasure, and very important, the right not to be subject to a decision based on solely on automated processing. All actors involved in the process, regulators, research and academia, standards organizations, designers, producers and service providers, and the end users as well must be involved in this way to implement strong AI risk mitigating measures. Thank you.
All right. And yes, thank you so much, um, everyone. And as promised, um, uh, this is our contact information for each of us, um, should you want to reach out. And we would love to hear from you, um, no matter what stakeholder group you belong to. Um, feel free to reach out to any of us. Um, so yes, I'll just um, maybe uh, allow you a few moments to, we have some time now uh, for the remainder of the session to uh, have questions and a discussion. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not sure, I can't see the room in Adis, but um, uh, I wonder if we should give preference to people who are physically present, if, they, um, if there's anyone who, um, uh, has any questions first, and then uh, maybe we can look at uh, the chat later. On, on the PA, uh, the Brazilian DPA, the NPD, uh, we've been following initiatives such as the DPAs regarding AI frameworks and uh also the oecd and my question is regarding that like considering that the oecd also is developing some studies uh on well the management of risk on ai systems uh is is that had has that been taken in consideration in any way uh any kind of comparative studies so you could see the compatibility about the framework that's being designed by the GPA and this one of the OECD. I mean, not saying that that's necessary, but at the same time, if we're trying to have some kind of standard for uh, uh, risk management framework, uh, at some point this should be done, right? Uh, yes, uh, I'm not sure if others um, want to chime in as well, but the OECD actually is um, uh, an observer to our working group as well. Um, and so, um, uh, of course, um, various there are various international organizations as well. The Council of Europe, I know, has done work. There's the UNESCO agreement as well on recommendations for ethics in AI. Um, and so, you know, there are a lot of frameworks out there. Um, we're primarily speaking from a data protection sort of point of view um, uh, to sort of reinforce the idea, um, because as I think I uh, mentioned at the outset that the specifics of data protection often get sort of left out from the frameworks or people just say, you know, comply with privacy and then leave it at that sort of thing. But there's a whole lot more to, um, to the issue as well. Um, so, yes, I mean, when developing this, we absolutely did look at other frameworks as well. And so um, there very well could be some overlap because of that. But um, uh, I don't know if anyone else wants to discuss um, uh, or add to that. No? Okay. Thanks, Diego. And it would be great to Just to add a couple of words, if you want. So what is happening in the area of artificial intelligence, more or less, as, as happened in the past concerning data protection, is a transnational issue. So the, in the different international fora, the idea, I'm saying to Tiago, is to be as far as possible consistent among the different instruments and the main uh, chapter, I would say, of the discussion we, we are saying. So yes, on one side, the, the GPA has looked at to other developing instruments and on the other side we see in the international arena that each one is looking at the development at regional and sovereign national level in order to be consistent with the solution proposed. There's a question? Hello, uh, this is uh, Vatasava from private private consultant from Ethiopia. I really wondering to know, uh, as far as I understand, AI systems, especially the modern AI systems, are relying on 
individual data sets, particularly individual private data sets, and an aggregated of this to, 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 to generate their, their results. So uh, I really wonder how we can enforce the privacy of an individual to be protected on the eyes of AI. In what form? Even, even under the legislation or under the law, how we can really, a user knows that his private data sets is used as on the systems uh, and so that he can claim his right. And the other thing that I'm really wondering is, um, it, I, I think I heard from the first presenter, she was stating that uh, all AI systems should be transparent for the users. And who are the users? After all that, they can understand these AI systems to deny or to, to allow to, or to give a permit so that they can clearly understand those AI systems that they cannot use it of their, their private data sets. Uh, I really, I really wondering to know these few things on, on these regards. Thank you. Uh, uh, transparency towards um, individuals. There are various stakeholders, as Roberto mentioned as well, that need to be considered when it comes to the use of AI. So you have what in data protection terms is called the data subject, which is basically the individual that will be impacted by the use of AI. Uh, you have the uh, stakeholders that decide to use the AI in the first place. Um, for example, uh, AI, AI may be used extensively and indeed has started being used in the public sector. So in the public sector context, you have public sector organizations that decide to use AI to distribute welfare benefits, uh, but that decision uh, effectively uh, has an impact on uh, citizens. Uh, and you also have the developers of the AI systems. So when in that kind of like a decision making process, when it comes to allocating resources and budget and, and, and all this kind of like uh, uh, state funding as effectively, um, you do need citizens uh, that are aware of AI being implicated in a decision that impacts them. And especially in particular data protection and Article 22 uh, has um, uh, relevance for what we call legal or signific similarly significant decisions. So we are not saying you have to explain to all individuals that AI is being used in any kind of context because that will create a lot of friction. But in, in, in the context of really impactful decisions for their lives, um, they should be made aware that certain decisions are automated and do not uh, entail the deliberation you would expect from, from humans. Um, uh, and in terms of this first uh, aspect of your question uh, and how uh, do, can we expect individuals to uh, retain their privacy rights in, in an age of AI, uh, there is a stream of work that the ICO is engaged in, and I, I'm aware other uh, data protection authorities and privacy authorities are probably working on, which is there is a field of research and technological development called uh, privacy enhancing technologies. So uh, machine learning can actually be used uh, to, uh, to kind of like harness the power of data while also preserving the privacy of individuals. So there are technical approaches to this. Uh, and we're trying to figure out ways where you can extract basically information um, and knowledge from the data sets without compromising the, uh, the privacy of individuals. Um, and just a final comment to round this up. Um, uh, well, at least in, the, in a UK and EU context uh, where GDPR uh, applies, or at least it applies to citizens, citizens within those two jurisdictions, um, those, fra those frameworks uh, have the aim of protecting uh, uh, individuals' uh, rights and freedoms. So it's not just about data protection or privacy, but it's about protecting their freedoms in general in relation to the processing of their personal data. That means that privacy is one of the rights that we seek to protect, but it's not an absolute right. Privacy needs to be balanced 
uh, with other uh, rights and freedoms. Um, and that's why data, data protection and privacy is really like a, a nuanced legal framework. So it's, there are no clear solutions yet, yet but um, technological approaches can help towards preserving privacy. And uh, yeah, I think I'm going to stop here. Thanks. Uh, Dal, if you don't mind, I'm, I'll just I'll just add, Sophie, that was a fantastic answer. So that was, I'm not going to add much more than to say that, um, you know, as this is not a new, I mean, it's a new kind of technology. It's a new world that we're, we're working through as, as regulators, but the, the pro the issue of, of individuals, um, being able to understand what is going on with their personal information is not just an AI issue, but something that I think that's, that's part of the reason why within our framework is, is putting data protection agencies at this, at the center of this, because this is where the expertise really is. And, uh, you know, often, at, at least from our perspective in our subnational jurisdiction, the only party in the ecosystem, if you want to call it that, that really knows what's going on is the organization itself. That's, or the, or the public body in our case, um, you know, the, it's unless there's a complaint and someone has a reason to 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 check, then there's it's hard sometimes for people to know what's going on, and so that's where um, requirements with accountability and requirements with trans with transparency and you know limited requirements of of notice um, are are really important in this case. And then of course, if that's not done, um, actual enforcement ability and consequences or accountability that that attaches to actions that might not that are inconsistent with um, the various national frameworks that that consist this privacy world and the last uh, one last comment uh, to this because we we heard so much before um but i think that what we heard uh, from sophia and ethan is um that there are existing tools that we already have and that we can can fall back on um, for example, from our classic supervisory uh, activities. So we heard a lot from Sophia and um, of course adapted to the challenges of AI, but um, at the end, it's not always necessary to start from the bottom up. We have a lot of mechanisms and tools we can use. And um, these are very, um, very strong tools. So that's just to have in mind um, after all the good things we heard before. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, are there any others? I don't see more questions uh, from the audience, audience on site. I don't see any online I either. I might just add that, I mean, even in terms of promotion, I mean, uh, part of that question was about how data protection, data subjects should know that they're in a data set. And, um, you know, consent is a big principle that's common in a lot of jurisdictions. And so um, obtaining meaningful consent and ensuring the individual uh, knows what's happening with their personal information from the first place is um, pretty central um, to ensuring that they can then exercise their data protection rights. Um, but otherwise, I mean, unless there's a lawful exception, and those exist, I think Ethan outlined, you know, there's research exceptions, um, and Sophia outlined, you know, there's uh, privacy enhancing technologies, there's synthetic data, there's de-identification that organizations can do um, to make personal information non-identifiable, um, and then use that to train their AI. Uh, and then that sort of alleviates any concern for, or much of, con of the concern for, um, uh, uh, what needs to be in place for, um, you know, what would otherwise be required for personally identifiable information. Um, so yeah, just to add in on that. So, uh, we have a couple of minutes left. So, uh, if there's no, um, further questions, uh, from the room, uh, or online. I mean, I wonder if anyone is willing to sort of share if they work in the AI space or, um, you know, have have uh, questions about um, how regulators are looking to deal with AI or just even more generally, uh, we're happy to discuss that as well.
otherwise I think um, we can wrap up and uh, let the next session uh, have some time to prepare for the, uh, to have the room. Thank you, Dal. Thanks to our distinguished panel. And in speaking for myself, as an ethical engineering lecturer in Peru, this session was essential for connecting the dots on AI's challenges in the following years. So uh, I can say uh, that now we can close the session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much.